Aloha and good morning. Uh, my name is Esther Kia Aina, and while I currently uh, work currently as the deputy for the Department of Land and Natural Resources, I am here in my personal capacity to express my viewpoints on what I think is a critical issue uh, that we have been dealing with as a people for decades. And because of my experience uh, working in Washington, D.C., at the Kamehameha Schools Land Assets Division and at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, my comments today will be Hawaiian governance and self-determination within the federal context. And before I go briefly into critical dates and actions that I think are important that have led us to where we are today and uh, where we need to go, I want to make sure that uh, you understand what my prism is with regard to uh, what is critical um, at the federal level. And that includes, of course, federal programs. We have a lot of federal programs, and people talk a lot about it. But at the end of the day, when you look from 1893 until now, the two critical issues is the establishment of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act in 1921 and outstanding land claims arising out of the overthrow relating to loss of sovereignty and lands. Uh, the federal government, as is well known by a lot of you, a lot of you are scholars, uh, practitioners, advocates within different realms of self-determination. So I'm not here to give you my viewpoint of history. I'm here to share with you uh, during my experience what I thought were critical junctures uh, since the United States has been actively involved uh, from the kingdom and into the state of Hawaii. For me, I have uh, divvied up the various periods to provide proper context uh, for where we are today. Uh, 1820, of course, uh, was significant, and although westernization started well before that, it was significant because of the impact of uh, Christianity in Hawaii. Uh, we had uh, great social upheaval, religious upheaval, economic upheaval, and of course strong political ties as a kingdom with the United States government and many uh, countries around the, world, uh, around the world. But one of the most important things that actually was a collaboration between the kingdom and Westerners, uh, which I believe has led us to the crux and the problem of where we lie today, is the introduction of private land tenure, uh, which was a major game changer in the way of how we look at the world. Uh, needless to say, from 1893 to 1921, we had great upheaval. We went from a kingdom to provisional government to a republic and to a territory. And uh, in all due respect to Prince Kohio, who ardently advocated uh, for the plight of his people, the federal government decides to establish the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, which is only 200,000 acres of the original 1.8 million acres of land that was ceded to the federal government in annexation. 1921 to 1983, interestingly enough, the focus by the federal government was only on the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act because that's what they knew. And they did a horrible job. From 1921 to 1959, they held title and management of the Hawaiian homelands and their management was abysmal. It was not until 1983 when you had the Native Hawaiian um, the Federal State Task for the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act that there actually were improvements. But uh, of course, during this period, you had uh, the 1959 State Admissions Act, which transferred uh, a program that they did nothing with, with the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. So they transferred 200,000 acres of the lands they took in annexation to the state to administer the Hawaiian Homelands Program. They kept 400,000 acres uh, for federal purposes, for DOD, for national parks, for, for wildlife refuges. And of course, they transferred 1.4 million acres of lands as a condition of statehood to the state of Hawaii uh, for the Public Land Trust, which of course includes one of its purposes, 
the 5F provision, uh, the betterment of Native Hawaiians. Uh, during this uh, time frame, uh, we also had the establishment of OHA at the state level, and uh, that is a vehicle uh, for land claims, which we just saw with Kaka'ako recently, and for reparations. So regardless of what anyone thinks with regard to how we're moving forward, the state constitution and state law rec recognizes uh, OHA as an entity to be able to settle claims into interim, short of even uh, working on the formation of a governing entity. 1983 was a very, very critical year. I already told you that there was a federal state task force on the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. Uh, out of that act, uh, uh, there was a lot of recommendations, but one of the best recommendations that came out of that was that a high-level person at the Interior Department be uh, appointed by the secretary uh, who was in charge, and remarkably, whether it was a Republican or a Democratic president, they held to their word, and they appointed normally the consular to the secretary. You don't have that today. And I ask all of you out there, including our Hawaiian homeland beneficiaries, why is that? Because that had been the norm, and it had been the norm until President Clinton, and it no longer is true. Uh, the other big issue coming out of that report was the claim uh, for Lualua Lei, which the state had failed in a timely fashion to sue the federal government for the illegal taking of lands out of the Hawaiian Homelands Trust at Lualua Lei. And that was late, later settled in actually 1995 uh, through Senator Akaka, and I'll talk about that a little more. Another important report was the 1983 Native Hawaiian Study Commission Majority Report, which concluded that the U.S. was not liable for the loss of sovereignty of land. Why is that important? It was important because it was a congressionally created commission. The commissioners switched from uh, Carter appointees to Reagan appointees. What do you think happened? Interagency-wise and in concert with the White House, they had predetermined that the conclusion would be that the U.S. would not be liable. Kinao Kamali'i, uh, of course, was uh, chair of the commission, but she issued a minority report that refuted that. The reason this is important is that basically from 1983 until the apology resolution in 1993, while the federal government made an effort to improve its relationship with the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, there was absolutely no discussion on the effort of self-determination. It was dead, not part of the discussion. So uh, those years are, are critical to remember. Um, I will jump to November 23rd, 1993, which is the apology resolution, and uh, Bumpy and others had mentioned it. I'm not gonna go into detail, because that could take a whole seminar. <laughs> But I will say this, that the key words in the uh, apology resolution is the term reconciliation, which clearly means redress, and apologize for the overthrow and its ramification, which is the loss of sovereignty of lands. Now, should we have spelt that out, put it in the committee report? If we did, the apology resolution would never have gotten acted into law. Uh, it is my personal belief that a lot of senators did not know what they were voting on because People talk about the apology resolution, but let's not forget, it came out in 1993, and what was that year? We modified the apology resolution to be a commemoration of the 100th anniversary. And I have to tell you, Congress loves commemorations. So when people came on the floor, when Senator Akaka was speaking on behalf, because we did have a battle, and people said, well, why now? And I said, oh, because it's the centennial. And they go, oh, OK. <laughs> uh, in any event, another two other things were very important for that year in 1993, so that you can understand why post-apology is uh, very important to understand where we are now. Uh, and that includes uh, an issue relating to the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. As I said earlier, prior to the apology resolution, all the federal government and uh, cared about and knew about what was the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. On January 19th, 1993, 
the DOI solicitor, uh, Mr. Tom Sansonetti, issued the most damaging legal opinion that I had seen during my tenure in DC that had argued that the federal government had no trust relationship uh, while it was administering it and after it transferred it to the state of Hawaii. And in one of its footnotes, this is 1993 now, this is under a um, Republican president, President Bush. Nine, uh, January 19th is the day before he leaves office. Uh, they have a footnote that says, we also concur with the majority findings of the 1983 Majority Study Commission report. They need not have to say that they were talking about claims arising out of the overthrow. I'm just highlighting that for you because that's indeed what they meant. We were going back with the Clinton administration uh, during the whole evolution of the passage of the apology resolution. They themselves did not think it was gonna pass. And so while it was passing in the Senate and House, lo and behold, after fighting with them all year to withdraw the Sansonetti opinion on November 15th, prior to the apology resolution heading to the White House, the Department of Interior withdraws the Sansonetti opinion. Now, the reason that's important is that although it never established a trust relationship, it took back a legal opinion that said none existed. So as far as I'm concerned, the Hawaiian Homes Commission has, has a clean slate. Uh, Post-apology to president, uh, to present, there's been a lot of wonderful things that have happened. We've had the return of Koho Olavi. We've had the Hawaiian Homeless Recovery Act. We've had the uh, Malka to Makai report, which was uh, done out of interior and justice in response to the apology resolution. We had the introduction and house passage of federal recognition legislation. We had the inclusion of Native Hawaiians in the U.S. position in support of the U.N. Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We had the establishment of the Native Hawaiian Role Commission. But most importantly, the focus of uh, the federal government is twofold now. It is on strengthening the relationship with the, with the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act and also addressing claims arising, arising out of the overthrow. So uh, where do we go now? With the second term election of President Obama, Native Hawaiians are in a critical period for moving forward on the Native Hawaiian Role Commission at the state level and federal recognition at the, at the federal level. And these are my recommendations. That we first work with the White House, Interior and Justice Departments administratively on how to move federal recognition or reconciliation forward. If the president does not have the authority to confer federal recognition through executive order, he can issue an executive order directing all agencies to implement the process of reconciliation with Native Hawaiians under the apology resolution and consider establishing an administrative process for federal recognition. Unless done right, however, a um, drawn out and newly created process specifically for Native Hawaiians can actually do more harm than good by opening a formal rulemaking process to a nationwide public commentary process. Detractors uh, can easily use this as a vehicle, vehicle to organize um, and to adamantly oppose Native Hawaiian rights. And it should be of grave concern, especially with the uh, social media angle of getting the word out. Uh, in the Congress, clearly, uh, Congress should continue to pursue uh, federal recognition. And with the prospect of US Senate Democratic leaders um, considering a, a review of the filibuster, re which requires uh, 60 votes, uh, we may actually be on the brink of the stars aligning for federal recognition and a host of other bills that have been stymied in the U.S. Senate for decades. I would like to see transparency also on who senators holds uh, bills under the unanimous consent calendar. The other calendar I talked to you about was the calendar that just goes simply to the floor. Under the unanimous consent calendar, one senator can kill a bill. What needs to happen while they're reviewing the filibuster is that they 
um, they released the name of the senator putting the hold. And the reason for that is that transparency leads to accountability, and accountability leads to more effective policy-making battles. Nothing's wrong with a battle. You just want to have a level playing field. Anyway, I talked long enough. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'm hoping that we can have some dialogue tomorrow on this.